Good afternoon and, uh, and welcome, and uh, thank you for coming at this later hour this afternoon uh, for a topic that I think is very important. Uh, we got into some discussions yesterday when we released our uh, recruiting uh, numbers, uh, which reflected uh, uh, 13 uh, months uh, where each uh, and every component, uh, service component, had achieved their recruiting goals. And uh, as we got on into our discussions, I noticed that you had ever-increasing interest, and so uh, Dr. Chu has agreed uh, to come and talk a little bit in depth about that. Dr. Chu, as you know, is uh, David Chu, is the Undersecretary of Defense for Personnel and Readiness and uh, a subject matter expert on this. And so let me get off the platform here and turn it over to him. Thank you, sir. Brian, thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Pleasure to be here particularly because I got to talk about good news. Uh, and the good news, as you know from the statistics released yesterday, is the department continued uh, in the month of uh, June to meet its recruiting goals uh, for all four of the active military services and for all but two of the reserve components. And most importantly in the reserve components, for both the, we met the goals, or have met the goals through the year now, uh, for both the Army National Guard and the Army Reserve. I think it's a great tribute to the spirit of young Americans today. We recruit for, uh, uh, for uh, our active forces about 180,000 young Americans a year, men and women. We recruit to close to 300,000 when you include the reserve components in those uh, totals. Uh, I think it's, it's an a, a antidote to those who question uh, the willingness of young Americans to put someone else before themselves, to put some larger cause first, it's an antidote to that skepticism about youth and its values uh, to see these numbers and to see their performance in the field. It's really been extraordinary. These young men are serving, as you know, because you've been there and you've seen that, under uh, often very difficult trying circumstances. They're serving very well, patient, willing to put up with deprivation, uh, difficult living conditions, and of course the constant challenge of operating in a counterinsurgency environment, which is not easy. They've done well. And the fact they've done well, I think, is a tribute to their qualities, to their high qualities. This is a group, as you know, uh, for which we set standards that exceed the norms of the American population. And there's been a great deal of talk about the standards. Let me cover where they come from. They come out of 30 years of, uh, of experience with a volunteer force as a great power since President Nixon ended conscription in 1973. Uh, and in the early years of the volunteer force, uh, as, as I know you appreciate, you back look at the history books, uh, we did not have the kind of quality we have today. In fact, in, I believe, 1974, 75, only half of the Army's male uh, non-prior service enlistees, actually less than that for the males, we only got to half because you count the women in the total, too, uh, had a high school diploma. 
In fact, Congress was so concerned with the aptitude quality of the force in that area, passed a statute uh, that said that we had to recruit a fixed percentage that would be high school diploma graduates uh, and a fixed percentage that should score in the upper half of the mental distribution as measured by the Armed, so armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test. Well, we, we easily exceed those standards today. The standards today come out of a National Academy of Sciences study undertaken for the department in the 1990s that looked at the history of how do people form uh, and the issue of what compensation package will you have to offer in order to recruit uh, that many people of those qualities. The standards have not changed. They are not going to change. They are the same. We aim for the Department as a whole to have 90 percent of our new recruits, meaning without prior service, be high school diploma graduates. We aim to have 60 percent score in the upper half of the mental distribution. And as you also know, we aim at high moral standards, which generally means any serious offense and you're disqualified. Now, in terms of those standards, 90 percent high school diploma graduates, that means you finished your high school and you walked across that stage and got a diploma, is above, well above national norms, which are in the 80 to 85 percent regime. Why high school diploma? Because it is the best predictor we found over many years of experience for whether you will stick with us. With due apologies to our high schools, it does not necessarily mean that you have a particular mental capacity. That's the purpose of the so-called ASVAB test, Armed Service Vocational Aptitude Battery. And so for your ability uh, to absorb training, your ability to perform on the job, which we've also tested, again with help from the National uh, Academy, uh, we uh, have come to the standard that 60 percent should score in the upper half of the uh, distribution. Of course, by definition, that means you're above the nation as a whole. And likewise, to the moral standards, these are high moral standards. Many people could not pass these standards. When you take all these uh, ingredients uh, together, what you have, of course, is the fine cohort of your people, the same cohort you saw marched to Baghdad in the spring of 2003, and whose, whose grit, whose determination, whose skill was celebrated by you and by the nation at that, uh, at that, uh, at that time. Uh, and as I emphasized, we believe we should continue with these standards because we think maintaining these standards is essential to our military capability and our military success. I'm delighted that so many young Americans are interested in joining, are interested in serving their country. Equally important and equally striking, as you know from the numbers we released yesterday, high proportions want to continue in service. Uh, and so we're having excellent retention both in the active components of our military uh, and in the reserve components uh, of our military service. And we're delighted by that. One of the important changes that occurred with the volunteer force of the last generation, of the last 30 years, is a much more experienced force than we used to have. And we think that's a benefit. There's also a cost. It means higher compensation, more family support uh, expenses. We're delighted to bear those because it gives you a far more effective military in the end, and I think you've seen that effectiveness in the field yourselves. So with that introduction, delighted to take, take questions. Again, this is a good news report. Uh, obviously, recruiting is a bit uh, like watching a high-wire performer. Uh, it, it's wonderful that we have done well so far, but there's always the challenge of tomorrow. And so this is a business where you can never uh, lose your focus. You can never uh, stop. Uh, concentrating on the next challenge. The next challenge, of course, is meeting the next month's uh, our goal, next month's target in terms of the recruits you'd like to bring in and the people you'd like to convince to stay with us. So we've done fine so far this year. We're projecting reasonably good results to the end of the year. Uh, of course, you'll be back September 30th to grade me and grade all of us on that performance. Uh, and and uh, obviously, uh, we will have to stand behind those figures at that time. With that, delighted to take your questions. Sir. Um, are you are you able or ready to predict whether the active duty army is going to make its 06 uh, uh, recruiting numbers? And um, on the on the issue of um, uh, the quality of the recruits, uh, you know the the maximum age has been lifted up to someone's 42nd birthday, I believe, uh, in the army. There have been a, there's been a slight uptick in the number of people receiving uh, morals waivers to get into the army. Um, could you respond to the notion that the military is making its recruiting numbers because it is 
accepting uh, volunteers uh, who are inferior to volunteers who may have been accepted in the past? Let, let me deal with your bottom line question first and come back to our specifics and, and check me if I leave something out of my response. The short answer to your question, are we lowering standards to increase recruit flow? No. The standards are the same. Right. I'm, I'm not even asking whether you're lowering the standards. Are you, are you accepting inferior recruits? No, is the short answer. Uh, we have, from the inception, recognized that the measures we employ, and I think you're particularly talking to the so-called armed services vocational after better test, the measure employee don't measure all of a person's abilities. That's why we are looking both at diploma, graduation, and the ASVAB test score. For the ASVAB test score itself, we recognize in the beginning that just because you scored low on the test doesn't mean you're going to be a bad soldier or bad sailor, bad airman. So for example, the test is given in English. There is an issue out there with several populations in the United States that, well, if they don't speak English very well, does this test in fact measure their underlying ability? Maybe not. That's why from the beginning we've allowed some aperture here. That's why we set the standard that 4% could be in what's called mental category 4, meaning the 10th to the 30th percentile uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, mental distribution. Uh, I might add, by the way, that we actually renormed the test uh, in starting in fiscal 2005, right, Bill? Uh, so it's actually a little tougher uh, now than it was three years ago. Uh, but we did not give ourselves any leeway in that regard in terms of what we look for uh, in our people. So no, we are not accepting people of, quote, lower quality uh, in terms of what we're doing in our making numbers. Uh, you had some specifics in there. I'm not sure I covered all the specifics that you well, had in mind. Uh, on the, uh, you know, I don't know if you're able to predict on whether you oh, think the going to make it. Uh, I have long learned in this business it's unwise to predict uh, because my job is to make sure the Army and Navy, the Air Force, Marine Corps succeed. And so we've set the goals for them. We've set the parameters, set the standards. And we're always hopeful they're going to make it, but the results have to speak for themselves when we get there. Staying, on, staying on the, uh, the standards, um, Category 4, which is a lowest acceptable mental category you, right. you bring in. Army, for many years, 10 or 15 years, took in 2 percent, and they doubled it to 4 percent. Uh, do you see it going above 4 percent? The short answer is no. I don't see it going above 4 percent. Uh, depends on what you mean by many years. Uh, you have to understand, I've been in this business for 30 years. Uh, let me just read you, if I might, the mental category uh, uh, four uh, percentages uh, at the nadir in the volunteer force, and in 1977, now this, uh, let me take 1980, uh, uh, which was even worse, when we had misnormed the test, it was, it was 56 percent. So I, I do think on this whole question of standards, and I came to this department as, as an appointee in 1981, we still were having high uh, percentages of mental category four in that year in the Army. One does have to take a long perspective. Yes, 4% is twice 2%. It is the standard. And one issue out there, frankly, is should we really permit, this is a matter of controversy in the department, should we really permit the military service to try too hard? Because come back to this issue of does the test measure all abilities? If I exclude people who might score poorly on the test but have other attributes that you might want, for example, foreign language capacity, uh, am I really helping the American military? And that's why we set the standard to say, yes, you may have some from this group, but we will set a limit as to how many there are. And why the 4 percent? Why the limit? I know DOD allows 4 percent. The, the limit uh, we, we, allows up to 20 percent, is that right? Uh, well, Cong Congress actually uh, set the standard in terms of portion for mental categories 1 to 3A, if I recall correctly. Right, Kurt, isn't it? There is a 20 percent congressional cap on the, on on the, the cap On the cap 4, is that right? Uh, Why not go up to 20? Because uh, we looked at this uh, in, um, uh, in the 90s. The department looked at it. I didn't. Uh, and in conjunction with National Academy of Sciences, balancing both uh, the payoff to aptitude, which is high on average, doesn't mean every specific individual uh, predicts well from that test score, uh, and the cost of the compensation package decided these, this is the distribution we should aim at. That's where the standards came from. So there was a careful analytic foundation for these standards. The evidentiary uh, fr uh, foundation for the standards is a set of tests the department performed in the early 1980s in which we put people of varying test score achievement 
through their paces, so to speak, in four specialties. One of them, for example, was Patriot battery operator. Uh, and what the department found from those tests was that there was, as the mathematicians say, a monotonically increasing return to aptitude. So if you, on average, so if you score higher in the test, take the Patriot operator, you find more targets, you identify more targets correctly, you engage more targets with the right procedures, and so on and so forth. Now, does that mean you want everybody at the top? No. First of all, there are only so many people who score at the top of this test by definition. It is, after all, norm to the national population. Second, the compensation cost of trying to aim there would be a prohibitive. Third, you would leave out all sorts of other characteristics. We all know people, forgive me if I insult anyone in this government, who are very bright but have no common sense. Uh, so you want a mix of qualities in your force, whether that mix is an individual or that mix is in the force as a whole. So maybe you have a bright person, you know, needs a little help getting out of the rain. You have someone with practical qualities that may not do quite as well, especially on the book learning kinds of things, which to some extent is what the ASVAB measures. So so bottom line is 4 percent is about the right number you think. You got it. And you don't plan or we, don't we, we are not trying to force people. We, we never really encourage people to go below 4 percent. If the services want to do that, was okay as long as they didn't spend a fortune achieving that outcome. But August and September are going to be the hardest months for recruiting. They're, they're, they're going to try to bring in a higher number during those months. If you, if you see yourself not making gold, do you think you might say, well, maybe 5 6 percent? No, is a short answer. And I think, uh, and I encourage any of you who, who uh, are curious about the view of our supervisors, talk to some of the sergeants major. One of the things they have said to us informally is, don't lower the quality of the force. Quality pays off. Quality pays off in ability to deal with difficult situations. Quality pays off in ingenuity in solving problems. Quality pays off in figuring out what, well, what did the lieutenant mean by those orders anyway? Sir. If I can stay with the standards, um, get a couple of reactions from me. One, um, your, your reaction to the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center report that uh, said there are estimates that thousands of soldiers in the Army are involved in ex extremist or gang activity. And also, uh, your action to reports that uh, recruiters have uh, looked the other way when potential recruits have displayed racist tendencies either in behavior or on tattoos because of an urgent need for recruits. Well, let me start with where, where, where I come in, which is uh, none of those behaviors are acceptable from the Department's perspective. Second, I have no evidence of an extent of issue of the sort quoted. Now, I'll certainly look at the Southern Poverty Law Center's report and see what foundation there is. It's not consistent with the reports I received from the Army specifically, which is the service targeted in that report, if I recall correctly, which reports very few cases uh, of the sort that they, uh, uh, they allege uh, uh, to have occurred. Uh, and actually, they don't actually assert they have occurred. They, ass they assert, nebulously, they're sort of out there someplace. Uh, the Army, as I understand it, does an annual survey of its installation, installation uh, staff. They are very watchful for this issue uh, because, again, it is not, these behaviors are not acceptable. To the tattoo specifically, you can't enlist if you have a tattoo that's inflammatory, period, regardless of the cover. There are two issues of tattoos. One is how much of the body is covered, what about exposed areas. Uh, there, the services have recognized reality. Young people, not that I would want my children to do this, and we have said no in our household, I would acknowledge that. But young people, for reasons beyond me, wish to have these tattoos. Uh, you know, at some point, if everybody does it, you're kind of stuck as, as uh, whether you're a civil employer or the military. But where we do draw the line is extent of coverage. So there are various rules. Each service has a different template as to what it will allow, and there's complaining about that, I would acknowledge. Uh, uh, but they all set a similar standard in terms of anything that's inflammatory. That is not acceptable. If you have that kind of tattoo, this is an easy standard to check. Uh, if you want to enlist, you have to remove it, which I understand is a very painful process. So you have to really want to join. Yes, ma'am. Um, does the fact that so many um, soldiers in Iraq have done two or three tours of duty at all um, reflect that you are having trouble recruiting, and do you figure it into your percentages? Uh, uh, no, I don't think it's because of trouble recruiting. Uh, I do think the extent of second and third tours is, is over-perceived uh, in, in the uh, national dialogue. Uh, it's not 
the typical situation. Typical person has done, in fact, many people have not gone to Iraq or Afghanistan in the force as a whole, uh, both active and reserve. Uh, second tours are not the norm, at least not far, and uh, not thus far. Yes, lots of people have done it. It's a big operation. And in some specialties, people have done it uh, at higher uh, at higher rates. But that reflects the demands on the force, in other words, the kind of capabilities that the commander on the ground needs, not any kind of recruiting uh, or retention issue that's out there. Uh, what is interesting to me is that we have not seen uh, a diminution, despite the demands made on the force, in the interest in staying in the service. Uh, and in fact, in the reserve components, we've had a surprising number of people volunteer to be mobilized a second, sometimes a third, uh, time. So we have not had a big issue with having to go back. Uh, it is, again, I think a great tribute to this generation of young Americans that they're willing to serve. They see a larger purpose here. They are patient with the on-the-ground political uh, process, and, and they are committed to the success of the operation. It's really quite, really quite heartening. Sir? If these changes you've made in the past right. year in terms of who you take in, if these changes don't have any impact on the quality of the recruits, then how come you didn't make them earlier? Uh, I'm not sure what kind of changes you're referring to. We, we have well, not changed our standards in the last Category year. 4, more Category 4s, more waivers, taking people no, no, with tattoos. Uh, well, let, 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 let me emphasize. Uh, yes, the Army has taken slightly more Category 4s than it took in the past. Again, against any kind of historical norm, it's almost imperceptible. Uh, against our standards, it's completely acceptable. They were exceeding our standard in that uh, period of time. But the other services, uh, uh, Category 4 exceptions, uh, accessions are, are the almost... The Army, then. Say again? Let's just limit it to the Army. Okay. Let's limit it to the Army. Uh, the Army has returned to the standard we set. We said 4 percent. So they've come back to that number, having been below it for a considerable period of time. But it doesn't have any larger significance in my judgment. They returned to where they were supposed to be. That's all. I mean, we haven't changed the standards over this period of time. The standards are where they were. If anything, on the moral front, I and mean, this gets to be a complicated issue of, of, of what the standards are, who has to approve waivers and all that sort of thing, uh, they, you could argue they've modestly tightened the standards. So for example, if I recall correctly, if you have a, a, a drunk driving conviction, the Army now requires a flag officer to decide whether or not they are willing to waive that, uh, that infraction. I won't ask how many have DUIs here. Sir. Sir, could you talk a little bit about why the age limit was raised to 42 and what sorts of jobs those soldiers would be doing or troops would be doing? Are, sure. they, are they going to be expected to go through some of the same training as someone who's 18 years old? The short old? answer is yes. Everybody has to meet the same standards. The physical, sta the, the physical test standards are, do have age brackets associated with them, so someone my age doesn't have to meet quite the same standards as a 25-year-old. I would acknowledge that. Uh, why age 42? Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the analytic answer is that people are living longer uh, and are much healthier and physically fit into older ages than was true in the earlier generation. And at the same time, the tasks to be performed out there increasingly demand mental abilities uh, and maturity. Uh, and we see that in the service of our reserve personnel. I think it's one of the reasons people are willing to accept the older ages. The typical reservist is five to ten years older than the typical active duty uh, a person. Uh, there is a further reason. Uh, uh, Mr. Rumsfeld is about to be, uh, what is it, uh, Brian, 74? 74. Right? Uh, he finds talk of someone at 42 being too old disquieting. Uh, and so uh, he has been an important force in encouraging us to see the wisdom in allowing those who are a little more senior but still physically able to serve. Uh, and that's a further factor in this. We're not going to have a large number of uh, older Americans join uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Importantly, I would argue, because people have their careers set by that time. They, they've, they've found their path, their lane, et cetera. They're not likely to suddenly change uh, and, and want to serve. On the other hand, a few do, and they may be fit, able, and offer the talents that we need. And if so, we're delighted to have them. And so the extreme case, which one of you reported on, otherwise I would never have known this case, uh, is there is a physician who is, I believe, back to your question, ma'am, on his third tour of duty 
uh, in a combination of Iraq and Afghanistan, who is 75 uh, and doing just fine. Thank you very much. So uh, people are able to function at high fiscal levels much later in life than was the case 20, 30, uh, 40 years ago. We need to recognize that reality. The old age limits were were dispiriting to Americans who wanted to volunteer. I, I actually had several cases where we had congressional letters of complaint, serious, heartfelt complaint. Why aren't you like, you know, I have a constituent. One was a woman, you know, she's 36, she, she's a nurse. She wants to be in the military. Why won't you let her? It was my unfortunate duty to say, well, you know, unfortunately, this is not our policy, the statute doesn't permit it, so on and so forth. So we changed the statute. Yeah. Sir. You, you had mentioned that the aggregate on retention is pretty good throughout the services. But I wonder if you could break that apart. That's the aggregate. When you break it apart, where are you seeing, in this most recent report, where are you seeing the, the flight, the people who are not recruiting, are retain, being retained at the level you want? Uh, at the, at the broad, at the broad, at, in terms of broad categories, so by period of service, first term, second term, so on, uh, we aren't seeing any uh, disproportionate pattern of losses. Now, I'm confident if you go to a specific career field, a specific year of service, surely you'll find some that fall short of our expectations. We tend to make it up in other years of a lifetime uh, view of how people uh, serve. That's why we have the bonus programs, is if, if we think we're not attractive enough for a particular skill, a particular experience level, we'll offer a stronger compensation package. And in general, the services have been successful uh, in making sure that we match our needs, i.e. skills by uh, years of experience uh, with what, the, what Americans are willing to do. So a uh, broad generalization is no, we're not seeing important patterns of weakness. Yes, people do leave. Not everybody stays. Uh, and in fact, to take the Marine Corps as an example, the Marine Corps doesn't, forgive me if I insult anyone here as a Marine, Marine Corps doesn't really want a lot of people to stay beyond the first term of service. It wants a relatively young force. It's got a very different if you like that phrase, human capital strategy from the other military uh, services. It's a model that's worked fine for it. That's okay. And so it doesn't offer as generous a package to continue as the others. So yes, there are lots of people who say, I'm out of here. But when you look from the enterprise level, which is what we must manage, the results are quite good, quite satisfying in terms of retention. You said one more? Okay, please, you've been patient. Uh, what does it mean to norm a test? This is just an uh, To, to uh, make sure that it correctly describes the reference population, meaning, in this case, the, uh, the men and women of the United States who are in the age ranges that we are seeking to recruit. So we give the test to a sample of um, young Americans, not necessarily in the military, and we look at the scores, and then we say, okay, here's the midpoint. You know, the average person got this number. And, and we have percentile ranks all the way down the line. It's just what the uh, educational testing service, same thing people do for SATs and stuff like that. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an abstruse and difficult branch of psychology, I would acknowledge. In the mid-1970s, the department goofed and misnormed the test. And we had a fascinating period of a year or two where the sergeants kept coming in and saying, you know, these recruits aren't as good as the ones we used to have. And the policy makers will say, no, 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 the tests also are fine. Well, it turns out the sergeants were right. The test was misnormed. So we had two or three years, which almost cost the volunteer forces future. This country. These two gentlemen participated. They have gray hair for a reason. Uh, uh, almost cost the volunteer force uh, as a national uh, instrument of national power because uh, we had so misgaged what the actual quality coming in. So norming the test, while it's a very technical issue, is very important to do, uh, do correctly. We've been very careful ever since every time we have to renorm it. You do have to renorm over time because as the recent results indicate, people are getting somewhat better over time. You would hope that's true given the educational system, so on and so forth. And so what is the typical score can change over time. In this last case, it went up by about two percentage points, right, Kurt, something like that, uh, in terms of what you have to score in order to be considered the median again or the 60th percentile, 70th percentile. You all remember your SAT. Uh, a challenge out there in the past. Thank you very much.